Uh, good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, joint uh, work session of the Glen County Mainland Planning Commission and the Glen County Islands Planning Commission. Um, the purpose for this meeting tonight is to hear a, uh, an update on the uh, Envision Glen, which is a zoning up, up update to our local zoning ordinances. Um, to give everybody the idea of what we're going to do tonight with regard to a format, is that every individual will have an opportunity to speak if you want to speak. You will be given one opportunity to speak, so you, you're not going to be able to come up and speak for five minutes on every question that comes up. So if you'd like to speak, you have five minutes. Um, this panel will allow you some leeway if you stay on task. Um, so, but at this point, uh, we're going to start with five minutes and see what happens. So, um, with that, I will um, turn it over to Wood Giles. If you want to, when it turns red, oh, you're good. All right, can everyone hear me? Good evening again, I'm Woody Giles with TSW. Got to see so many people in the audience tonight. My uh, firm has been hired by the county to facilitate the zoning update process, so um, you'll be seeing a lot of me over the coming month, and I recognize a lot of familiar faces in the audience, so glad to see you all here. Wanted to go over just a few ground rules before we get started. We talked about these at, at all of the meetings, if you will, silence your devices so we can all hear each other. If you the restrooms that have got the door you can in and just down to the right. Um, the materials uh, tonight are uh, already online in the sense that the diagnostic report is online, but we will have the presentation slides online. Um, Really, our uh, point tonight is to have a listening session. This is an open forum. We've had a number of public meetings already, and I'll go through what we've heard at those meetings, but we're going to spend most of the time tonight listening. I'm just going to present for a little bit, so we'd love for everyone to, uh, to be heard, but uh, for that, we would like to ask that everyone show respect to the members of the commission and uh, to myself so that we can um, hear the information we need to hear with respect. So. Thank you. Our last couple of meetings have been great. We have felt very respected. So thank you all for cooperating with the Glen Rules. So uh, everyone has a copy uh, of the agenda tonight. Want to go over just briefly the zoning update and what it is, because I know there's a lot of people here for the first time. This is your first zoning update meeting tonight. Um, talk about sort of what we've heard our last most recent public meetings. Um, talk about the diagnostic report, and then we'll break for, for public comments. And as the chairman mentioned, uh, mentioned that's five minutes per person. I will say that um, the comments on the policy questions in the diagnostic report, which I'll talk about a little bit, are what we're really seeking input on right now. Um, I know there's a lot of other comments, and we've received many, many comments, but if you don't like my haircut, that's not particularly helpful to the zoning update process. But if you have something to say about the zoning update and specifically the policy questions, that would be fantastic. And um, I will stay as late as we need to tonight to answer any questions, even after the meeting adjourns. So I hope no one feels rushed if you have a lot of comments. So uh, many of you know about Envision Glen, which is the county's official comprehensive plan that was adopted a couple of years ago. There was a ton of public outreach related to that process and a lot of good discussions. It's one of the better county plans that, that I've read, so congratulations on that great process. That is sort of the policy picture, the big picture direction of where the county is going. But the zoning ordinance is really where the rubber meets the road. So that's the rules that developers that have to follow. And those rules are not exactly what we would want them to be today. So the goal of this process is to build on the goals established by the Envision Glen Plan, make sure that the zoning is brought up to date so that as development happens for the next generation, because this is a long-term effort, it matches what happened in the plan. 
the plan has helped us out a lot because there was a lot in the plan about updates that needed to happen to the zoom ordinance. So um, if you read it, it talks about design criteria, it talks about environmental regulations, it talks about infrastructure, it talks about parking and traffic, a lot of things that we've been having conversations about and things that we know the zoning isn't the only answer to. There are a lot of other things that need to be done and a lot of things that are already being done at the county level and private level to help these. But zoning is going to be a big piece of how we do these. So today, this zoning update, we've established a number of goals, and the main goal is support the implementation of Envision Glen. Again, fantastic plan, and we want to make sure that that is put into place. The second is to advance the vision of local businesses and residents. We really wanted this to not be an off-the-shelf zoning code, but to make sure that we're listening to everyone in the room and all the local stakeholders. So that's something we're going to be big on over the coming months. Um, encourage appropriate growth and promote economic development. There's a balance there to be had, obviously, between what is appropriate growth and what is not appropriate growth. So we'll have some conversations about that, but that's one of our goals. Balance development rights, um, which I would say landowners rights there too with sound planning principles is another important compromise that we'll have to talk about. Preserve natural resources, this is another thing that the Envision Glen plan talks a lot about. So we'll be talking about um, the environment sea level rise and then how to make sure that Glen County is resilient. In general, regulations are easy to understand and administer. If you read the zoning code today, there's a lot that is very confusing and we want it to be understandable to the average person, of course, to the developer, but also to those of us who are not developers. And establish the right amount of regulations. So our goal is really not to make things more strict than they need to be or write a lot of regulations that are needless, but to figure out what the community wants, what the goals are, and then make that happen with just the right amount of regulation. So, quick overview of our goals. The process that we're in is um, we started with a process of analysis and listening and review. We're part of that. We had a lot of uh, interviews with community stakeholders and person on the phone. Charting a course is sort of where we are right now. That's figuring out what's important to people, what needs to happen as part of this zoning update. Because we didn't want to go back to our office, write uh, zoning events and say, what do you think? We wanted to make sure that we were writing something that reflected the needs of the community. So our goal there was to spend a lot of time and we had a lot of public meetings around having these conversations. After that, we will start writing some draft changes to the zoning ordinance and ultimately go through a uh, final update process. So in terms of the calendar, this uh, the beginning of this year um, and the summer was sort of the first part. This fall has been a lot of charting the course, but we're not going to even start writing any draft zoning regulations until probably next month and through next year. So some of you are, are eager to see what are the new regulations or what does this mean, um, and we'll have more conversations about that next year. And ultimately, the county commission is who will vote to adopt this in the ordinance, and it's the county that enforces it. So we'll have to go through, once we have a final draft, all of the usual public hearings, and that will happen next summer or next fall. So we should a little bit, uh, one size does not fit all. When you look at the, the Envision Glen plan, you see the map on the right, which has divided Glen County into different character areas. The point being that not all parts of the county are the same. And we know um, that looking at the front of the room now, because we have the Highlands Planning Commission and the Mainlands Planning Commission, that's one great example of where things are different. But even smaller than that, at the neighborhood level, things are different. So when we look at potential zoning solutions, we're not trying to write something that is one size fits all, but saying what are the unique problems in different parts of the county and what kind of regulations do we want to write to solve those problems. I'll also mention um, this zoning units will be for unincorporated Glen County, so this will not include what is in the city limits of Brunswick. And we'll also not include Jekyll Island because that's regulated by a state authority, but everywhere else in Glen County is a part of this effort. So uh, I guess this was back in May, is that right? We had a kickoff meeting in this very room. We had more than 100 people. Um, I'm curious how many repeat offenders we have. Was that our first kickoff meeting? Great. Um, 
glad to see you back. So um, we had a, a much longer introductory presentation from our team in terms of why we're here and what the zoning update is about, and you can find that online if you want to check it out. But most of our time we spent um, at comment stations and just hearing from people on topics that we knew were important, things like traffic and density and the environment and just asking very open-ended questions. We got a lot of feedback there and all of those detailed comments are online if you want to check them out. So based on what we heard at that meeting and based on our team's very detailed reading of the zoning ordinance, which took a lot of, of time, there's a lot of regulations. We read a zoning ordinance, the subdivision ordinance, and there's a lot of other ordinances related to flooding and alcohol permits and everything else, and we read all of that and um, marked it up. And, and I will say, uh, usually when we go through those, we sort of mark them up with a highlighter of passages that maybe need some improvement or that we have questions about. But I think Glen County is the first time that I've gone through three highlighters in working through a code. So definitely a few, a few places for improvement there. Um, so the diagnostic report talks about a lot of what we found as, as we look through it, so I encourage you to read that, and there's some copies on the sign table if you didn't get one, and it's also on the county's website, uh, which is glencountyga.gov slash zoning update. You can find this report uh, there if you want to look through it while I'm talking, but just a, a couple of summary bullets. A lot of the regulations are uh, unclear or a little bit confusing. That's not just anything against the county because all zoning ordinances are sort of a patchwork over time. Your zoning's been around for um, since the 1950s, and so there's a lot of changes that have been made since then, and so some things just don't fit together and need a little cleaning up. Um, it's a little long, as I mentioned, but there's also a number of things that don't match the policy direction that is what we heard is important to people, and that's what is written in Envision Glen. So the diagnostic report has these four sections that say these are some things where the county plan and the zoning ordinance don't line up, or where the zoning ordinance and what we're hearing from the public don't line up, and we don't have the answers yet, and I don't have the answers for you tonight. That's what will come next year with some potential draft changes to the zoning ordinance, but these are just questions. And so our goal really at this point is to say, are these good questions? Are there things that we should be asking? Are these things that we should continue? Continue to explore. Are there any questions we're not asking that we need to ask, add to the list? Are there questions on the list that are not appropriate that we should take off? Um, or do you have any specific comment on this question? So that's really the meat of the report, those pages. It's broken down into design and site questions, procedural and administrative, which is what deals with things like how reasonings are handled and what's the role of the planning commission. Streets and transportation, because we've heard a lot about that, especially as it relates to traffic and miscellaneous. So there's a lot of other stuff in there, environmental regulations and other stuff. So um, that will, I hope, be the, the meat of our comments and what we would like to hear from you tonight is response to the questions in the report. So after that report was released, uh, we had another special joint call planning commission meeting to um, work for the planning commissioners to review that, and we had uh, the public in attendance at that meeting, but it was just a planning commission meeting, so the public was uh, not allowed to speak, and that's why we're having this meeting with the commissioners again to allow the public input. But we also had a number of public outreach events after that to get some input on them. The first one of which was here in downtown Brunswick on uh, first Friday night. We set up in a temporary storefront space and we weren't able to have the whole diagnostic report available. I mean, we did have copies, but because it's so detailed, we picked just a couple of questions to ask people as they were passing by and we really had great, great responses. It was a good night and more than 100 people and a lot of those were from the main one, so it was good to get that perspective. The questions we were asking were around open space, coastal regulations, which relate to the environment and sea level rise, uh, walkable neighborhoods, the idea of having a place that is mixed use so we can walk to the corner store or have better sidewalks, not really something that the zoning ordinance allows in Glen County today and not something that's appropriate everywhere, but we were asking people if it was appropriate in some places. Um, and then this is about design regulations, thinking about um, how a site is designed, um, what art was architectural design, sort of all of those questions. There's some regulations today that Glen County is asking, do you think they should be more, uh, more strict or more regulations? So 
unfolding. We got um, support for all of those uh, concepts. People said, yes, keep thinking about this. We want to hear more specifics, but we want to continue that conversation. And also a lot of comments, so you can check those out online. Then uh, the next day at Coast Fest, which I know many of you were there as well, we had a, a booth set up and also engaged more than 100 people there. Similar comments there, we got very strong support for open space and walkable neighborhood. On the coastal regulations, people seem to be more comfortable with, with moderate regulations, not too strong, but also not too weak. And when we asked about design regulations, they said yes, but it should be something pretty low or minimal. So on, on all of these, it's not necessarily a yes or no answer. It's sort of where on the spectrum do you think Glen County should be, and where on the spectrum do you think you are part of Glen County should be. Um, so interesting to see that and again detailed results online. Then we wanted to have a meeting that really delved into the content of, report, of the report and we knew that was going to be a very detail-oriented and long meeting, so we scheduled a zoning workshop the same Saturday, Saturday afternoon, the same day as COSEST. And we weren't sure how many people we'd have because it was this very technical meeting, but we had more than 70 people show up, um, which I know is a lot of you in the room and we'd love to see just show of hands how many people at the, the workshop. Okay, great. So that is where we really dived into almost every single policy question in the report and said, let's go line item by line item and say, what do we need to be talking about here? Is this question still on the table? And what do we need to know about it? So really good discussions there. We sort of grouped it around three themes, density, design, and environment. And each of those had an introductory presentation to talk about what does this anyone else do today? Um, talk about some case studies from other communities in some instances. And then we broke into, you can see here, uh, sort of discussion groups and said, go through these questions and provide comments. And we got a ton of comments from that meeting. So uh, really appreciate all of this. Actually still going through all of those comments, but you can see them online. We also uh, have gotten, the, the photo at the right here is the photo of my desk. We've gotten a lot of mail-in comments on this process, which has been great. And a lot of uh, people took the policy questions that are actually published in the paper and wrote comments, uh, you know, saying yes, 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 can, you know, keep thinking about this, no, don't think about that. Um, so that's very helpful, and um, we'd love to continue to receive those comments. So um, you can send those either to, uh, to me, to my company, TSW, you can find our mailing address online, or I can give it to you after, or you can also send those to the county. You can find the, the county address online on their website, or you can talk to the county staff afterward. If you um, would rather by email, we set a special email address, zooming update at glencounty gagovernor that goes to our consulting team and to the county staff, so we are able to see all the comments that people are and we've got a lot of comments that way too. There's also a phone number uh, there if you want to call in um, to the county. Were we able to get comment cards here tonight or are we just taking verbal comments? Okay, we don't have comment cards tonight, but if, I know several of you have written comments. If you do, please bring those uh, to me or to the staff at the end of the night and uh, we'll be taking detailed notes on the verbal comments that I've given. So I mentioned the public meetings we've had. The next public meeting is going to be early next year. We haven't set the date. I think we're aiming for February. And that will be like not a draft zoning ordinance, but here's some draft ideas for how we could update the zoning ordinance based on what we've heard so far. Um, so we'd love to have you come out to that. There'll be a lot of detail again at that meeting, so we may do an open house style, so we're not um, bounding everyone in a four-hour meeting, but uh, allowing you to sort of move at your pace and see what's there. So stay tuned for more info on that. And uh, I should mention also, if you didn't sign in, uh, Please make sure you did, and you'll be added to our email list, so we'll send out email blasts. We've only sent a couple, so we won't fill up your inbox, but the next time there's a public meeting, you'll get the notice about that. Um, then once the draft code is actually written, later in the spring or in the summer, we'll have another public meeting around that, and as I mentioned before, the sort of formal process where the county commission votes on this, will have several public meetings in the fall. And um, I said this at our, our last meeting, we're really not in a rush to do this. I know this is sort of an 18-month process, but if it needs to take longer, or if we find out tonight or any time along the way that there are additional concerns, that there are topics that come up that we haven't thought about, that people are not yet comfortable with the draft or what we're proposing, we would love to hit pause for a couple of months, 
have an additional public meeting, take time to regroup. So we're not trying to um, rush this, but we want to make sure we get the, the best output. So um, I think I, I covered most of this in terms of, of, of what's next. I mentioned we've had a lot of comments and haven't had a time to review all of those yet. We're still uh, going through the pile, so we'll be making sense of those comments and the comments that we get here tonight. Our uh, other next step is to share everything that we've heard, um, both from our own study and what's in the diagnostic report and what we've heard from the public with the county commission, just to say, hey, here's what your constituents are saying and here's what we've identified as some options for the zoning update. So that's going to be at a county commission work session, uh, I guess not next Tuesday, but two weeks from tomorrow at 2 p.m. And that meeting is open to the public. So if you'd like to come um, attend uh, that meeting and, and hear our presentation, you're welcome to attend. And I will say, um, we love lots of public comments. We are not here to write zoning and it's for you. We really need to hear from everyone in the room. So you can't email us or write us or call us too much. We'd really love to hear that. And then when we stand up in front of the commissioners, we can say, here's what we're hearing. Here's what's important to your constituents. So thanks for all the comments we've gotten so far. So um, I think with that, we'll, we'll break for questions and comments. I know for a number of you, this is your first meeting, and that was a pretty quick overview. Um, so if you're able to kind of look through the diagnostic report with the comments, that will help you get a little more background. But we did want to, as I mentioned, we didn't get the opportunity at the last uh, planning commission meeting for public comments, and we've got a great crowd tonight. So we'd love to um, hear from everyone. Should we just go ahead and open up the mic? Yes, please. If you would uh, like to speak, please come forward to the podium and please introduce yourself and uh, state your, where you live for the record. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to talk to one of the policies that was mentioned. Um, my name is High Post, and I'm a resident of St. Simons Island, full-time resident. Uh, in the zoning draft, there's this line, we should preserve natural resources while considering community resiliency and the impact of sea level rise. Those are nice words but I don't think the emphasis is nearly strong enough. Resilience should be the prism through which every planning, zoning, and infrastructure decision is viewed going forward. If a decision will better protect us from storms, sea level rise, and flooding, then it should be a priority. If not, we should think about it. We're living in an era of weather extremes. For us, flooding is our biggest risk. Storms and hurricanes are projected to be more frequent and more intense. We should not think we're immune or that this is a problem to leave to our kids to solve. The seas in Georgia have risen seven inches since the mid-90s. They're currently rising at the rate of an inch every two years. That rate has been increasing. When you drive over the causeway today during a king high tide, you can notice the water spilling over the sidewalks already. Today, think of it a foot higher or more in just 20 years. This zoning update represents an opportunity to shape our future and the future that we leave to our children. I would argue for more emphatic consideration of resiliency goals not to the exclusion of other needs, and, but as a central organizing principle for all future planning. For citizens and businesses here, resiliency planning now can lower our flood insurance rates, it can preserve our home values, and protect our economy. For every dollar we spend today on storm protection, we'll save $7 or more in disaster recovery costs. That's what the insurance people say. Resiliency means common sense. My understanding is the state tonight will start to resurface the tourist causeway. It's supposed to cost $3 million. As far as I know, 
I may be wrong, but I haven't read anything that they're planning to raise the causeway level. If that's indeed the case, we're about to spend a lot of money on a road that's almost guaranteed to need another redo soon to keep it above water. It was in the Envision Glenn document a couple of years ago to request a study of the causeway's resilience to sea level rise. I haven't seen anything that that was done. Perhaps it was, but it wasn't very well publicized. How much more should we spend before we actually figure out what we really need? I understand the state pays for that, but it's our problem. Recent studies have shown that Glen Perry salt marshes have a better chance of not dying, of not drowning, than in other areas of the East Coast because there's not a lot of slope here. That enables salt marshes to migrate upland as the seas rise. This is really good news if we do everything we can to protect our saltwater marshes, which protect us from storms and support our fishing. But if we develop near the marsh, we increase our risks dramatically. If anything, we need bigger buffers. In Miami-Dade County today, they're having huge issues with septic tank failure from sea level rise today. In Glen County, as of 2016, there were 9,700 documented and 4,600 undocumented septic tanks. When the ground is saturated, wastewater can't be treated properly, and that allows for contamination to get into our groundwater, surface water, and our wells. Should we be permitting a lot more septic without knowing whether those systems will still function when the sea level rises by another foot or two? When you're considering impact fees, lost, and new development, I think we really need to look at the whole playing field and act accordingly. The JWSC has developed a great vulnerability assessment that I just discovered, and it should be closely considered in further defining this draft. Reading it, it's scary to consider how much needs to be done and how far behind we seem to be. The county has a good 2017 disaster recovery plan. And that's another document that should be closely considered. As far as I can tell, very little has been done to address the immediate high priority needs contained in either of these documents. Even though there are apparently many millions of dollars in block grant funds available today if we just go after them. Mr. Post, you're about 30 seconds over. If you okay. I'm about done. One third of the Netherlands today is below sea level, but Rotterdam is one of the most successful seaports in the world. They make resiliency a priority. Let's make Glen a model for resiliency rather than a victim of floodwaters that we know are coming. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Hugh Bork. I'm a St. Simons Island resident. Uh, I've just provided a hard copy of my comments on the document. It's also posted on the email, the county email site, uh, so you have an electronic copy of what you have hard copy. Um, I have really three questions based on the allotted time I have tonight. A lot more to come later. But uh, in the kickoff meeting, uh, the consultant characterized about the effort as about 30% of uh, rewrite and balance of it being. Uh, uh, editorial. After reading this document and whatever, first off, my perception was that was a little light, okay? And I'm not an expert, so I'll characterize it that way. But after reading the document and participating in a number of the events today, it's even lighter. So my concern is that we're going to get it done in the time for the budgets that we've laid out. I don't want to see it rushed, and we've got a number of those in the county that have had uh, what I'll consider less than acceptable results. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, will, the kick up, uh, will the revised ordinance address the return of the, uh, the uh, site plan approval to the IPC and MPC that was uh, taken away about a year ago by the Board of Commissioners? And the reason I ask that is um, it has taken those documents and taken them out of the public purview. Granted, you can get them online and whatever, but the vetting of those documents out in public space in the in the 
in the uh, uh, commission meetings, I thought was very valuable for the insight of the, both the planning department, identifying corrective action, so you got another 50 set of eyes out there looking at the documents, but that's pretty much gone away, and we had not seen a marked improvement in the end product coming out the backside of that uh, process. So I would ask that that be considered and put on uh, back on the table for consideration. On page nine of the document, your question regarding regulating regulation of pervious services, and the way it's phrased is somewhat concerning to me. I know it's not a final uh, final ver uh, version, but the way it's uh, said which is talking about reducing the requirement for pervious services. I'd like to remind the folks that the soils out here, in the, particularly in the islands, is a sandy loam. A lot of that undisturbed, non-developed area is a sponge. Whether you have a severe storm or just the afternoon thunder shower, that per permeability of that, that's, that land is the crux of our stormwater. We spend a lot, not enough, but spend a lot of time in maintaining this, the uh, stormwater drainage, etc. Right? But when you put it in a development, particularly the higher density of uh, multifamilies on the same portion, the, the pervious surfaces goes away. So if anything, that pervious requirement ought to be more restrictive. Instead of being 50%, it should be 25% uh, of impervious services if we want to keep our drainage. And I bring yourself, bring your attention, a couple of real life events that I personally have witnessed. I grew up in East Baton Rouge Parish in Louisiana. Nothing flooded out there, including the major storms of Betsy, particularly when we had the unfavorable winds and the storms that packed in Lake Marpaw and Lake Pontchartrain that, that impacted our ability for drainage. Nothing flooded in that period of time. Guess what's been flooding in the last 10 years? Same comment about Katy, Texas. The folks that took the flooding in the recent uh, storms and extended rains over there, same issue, very similar soil conditions. A lot of that is, is attributed to deletion of impervious soil or, per, or permeable soils and the eruption of stormwater flood, uh, stormwater flows to the natural uh, estuaries I mean, in those areas. Guys, that's something we've done to ourselves with all due respect to the last com uh, commenter. That's self-imposed. That's not, that's not nature causing the water to rise. We did it to ourselves in those particular areas, and we're doing it to ourselves here in the islands. It's happening as we watch, okay? Next item, or last item I'd like to uh, ask the question is, one of your uh, comments uh, on page 16, you address Article 1, the preamble and the enactment clause in the zoning ordinance. This section addresses regulating and re uh, regulations of what, what the aim is of the zoning ordinance. It has a number of items that are addressed. I only hit the high spots. Uh, one of them is property value. One of them is uh, congestion on the streets. There's about 10 or 15 items in that preamble that says this is what the ordinance is supposed to do. I've asked questions and comments in both the Island Planning Commission meetings and the Board of Commissioner meetings, and that's been dismissed by county council is that's not enforceable because it's not part of the criteria for the respective um, uh, districts that, that apply. Okay? Make it so. Okay? Make sure that that's there. All right? Those are a number of, co of comment or of, of requirements that are in the ordinance that apparently are interpreted as not enforceable. So I would suggest that those be addressed, and that's a silent point in your uh, diagnostic report, or if it's there, you need to help me out with it. That's the end of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, Mike McKinney, I'm over on the island. Uh, you have on page nine fences and walls. And it's been changed. Uh, there are currently some minimum fence and wall heights. And then down should their building uh, permits uh, be required for certain types of fences and walls. Um, an issue right now that, uh, and I've sent pictures in, I don't know if you, they have access to those pictures or not, but I have some here, uh, situations uh, that there is an industry standard once you go over eight feet. Uh, well, first let me say that there are no ordinances for uh, residential property. It's only for commercial. Uh, and Glenn County chose to not enforce state law, which leaves it up to, on fencing, leaves it up to the individual uh, jurisdictions to enforce or not enforce. 
Um, anyway, there is an industry standard uh, which you go above eight feet that it switches from four by fours to six by sixes. Also, there is a diameter of the anchoring and the, and the, the um, depth of the post to ensure um, safety issue so that fence has a chance to stand the several hurricanes that we've had here. And then uh, right now, so it's because there are no ordinances on any fence issue, is you have to take it civil. And I've got an issue now with a 12-foot fence that is built with a hurricane anchoring system that will ensure the fence will fall on my property. And I have to sue him starting at about $15,000 to $40,000 to take that fence down. And because there are no ordinances, he dismantle it and move it back six inches. And he can put the fence back up again. Uh, I've got several pictures. There's a HOA issue with another 10-foot fence that, if there had been ordinances, would not have been allowed, but it ended up with $45,000 civil lawsuit to take the fence down even though they have ordinances in the uh, Ed Covenants in their HOA. So what I'm asking for is that at least the eight foot and above fences on the private property, which as St. Simons continues to shrink, what you're seeing is they're coming in and replacing the smaller homes on the smaller property and then erecting the fences. So for a safety issue, eight foot and above, let alone the uh, aspect of how it looks, uh, they can get into that, but for the safety issue of eight foot and above, that they should have ordinances because you need an offset for the anchoring system and the uh, standardization of a, um, like I said, the, the pillars that you're using. Uh, I don't think that a judge should be judicially legislating safety on the islands or here in the zoning for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jeff Kilgore. Um, and uh, just before we came up here, we took a quick and formal survey of the people in my group. And but we don't think anything's wrong with your haircut. And the people who complained are totally out of line. So, um, I think that uh, Hugh said pretty much everything I wanted to say, and so I almost went back and sat down, but I figured people would say, people were chickened out, and so uh, I wanted to follow through with the emphasis on a couple of points he made. Uh, the vision statement in your document, uh, Glen County quality of life, character, culture, natural beauty, value protected by, and so on and so forth. Um, the preamble does uh, very specifically state several things that I think are important to the overall effort, um, particularly the uh, preservation of property value. The next most important thing is another thing you touched on, and so I'll just mention it briefly for reinforcement. The previous surfaces and the continued uh, permitting of construction in wetlands must stop. Uh, the preservation of what uh, does exist now for the soil water is, in my opinion, essential. And there are many documented cases of longtime residents experiencing flooding on St. Simon's Island, and it is really unnecessary. Um, the restoration of uh, uh, preliminary plant to the Planning Commission, on uh, the Island Planning Commission particularly, uh, I think you can find some very robust preliminary plat sections in the ordinances in Chatham County and Clark County particularly. And uh, what we've had historically was woefully inadequate. And it's even worse now since the Board of Commissioners in their wisdom took that responsibility away from the citizens. And uh, I think it should be restored and I hope that that's where you end up. Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm Ken Jacobson. I live in St. Simons uh, in the village down by the lighthouse, permanent resident. Um, 
And I'm impressed by all the planning initiatives going on in the community. From Forward Glen to New City Brunswick to sea level rise and resiliency groups to the zoning ordinance rewrite supported by TSW work. And Envision Glen is rich with insights, ideas, and proposals that align with the common values being expressed by these different groups. The community is speaking loudly and optimistically right now, and we'll really need our commissioners to seize the moment in ways we've not asked them before. In the immortal words of Yogi Berra, the future ain't what it used to be. And that is said is apropos at this moment. Everything's changing quickly. And the implications ranging from downtown renewal to sea level rise to zoning ordinances and more are real. It's clear that the people of the Golden Isles are thinking a lot about these things and are poised to shape a new future. Such change requires stepping out of the box, and we need our elected, elected officials to step out with us. Three or, four, three or four things stand out to me from all these activities. First, community involvement is in a wonderfully heightened state on both sides of the causeway. Second, the way in which commissioners rewrite our zoning ordinances is critical. Those ordinances will shape short-term activities and long-term outcomes for the next 25 years, indeed longer than that. Once they're written, we'll live with every word, phrase, codicil, and quirk, and either relish the consequences or endure the consequences. There are pivotal moments that define a community legacy. I don't believe it's an exaggeration to, to suggest we're stepping into such a moment. Third, the TSW report shows that the people of Glynn County, from Brunswick to St. Simons and throughout, have clearly articulated their preferences to contain traffic, preserve our unique charm and beauty, strengthen, not strain, the infrastructure, and foster smart, regulated growth that preserves the integrity of all these wishes while creating a strong economy and a great place to live. And fourth, the topic of resiliency, which underscores the growing threat of sea level rise and its impact on everything from roads and infrastructure to economy, everyone's economy, whether commercial or public finances or one's personal assets. A focus on resiliency, which is guiding coastal cities all over the world, including our neighbors in Tybee and St. Mary's, can serve as the prudent anchor to each decision the county makes. Lastly, zeroing in on water and sewer and its known efficiencies across the county, and which will become increasingly glaring as more storms and floods come through, I'm with the many who believe a 2020 SPLOST initiative should dedicate the majority of its publicly paid tax dollars to supporting the Joint Water and Sewer Commission's extensive laundry list of needed repairs and upgrades for flood protection. Our recent hurricane evacuations put a spotlight on the perils of an overwhelmed system. If I might summarize, the people who live, work, and play here are super actively engaged in creative new thinking about how to make impactful changes to protect and expand the best elements of the Golden Isles. Delivering a bolder future requires a different kind of planning, coding, agreements, and incentives. And the combination of bold new thinking with the realities of rising sea levels and rare storm surges presents a major opportunity for us to plan differently and act in accordance with the future that is emerging, one that is considerably different than the past we are leaving. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm uh, David Cotter with the Center for a Sustainable Coast. Some of you may know me years ago when I worked for the Regional Development Center. And uh, maybe uh, you know me a little bit uh, more uh, controversially from the opinion paper. I often have uh, letters published about environmental issues, primarily uh, more recently climate change issues. And I'm very uh, encouraged to see that addressing sea level rise and the, uh, and the uh, master plan and in this uh, vis visioning process. Um, consistent with that thinking, um, I'd like to bring to your attention some things that are going on around the nation and around the state by local governments to reduce not just the impacts by virtue of resiliency and adaptation and good planning of infrastructure and improved uh, drainage through uh, reducing previous surfaces that work, but also <clears throat> through the uh, adoption of 
programs for reducing greenhouse gases locally. This has been done by Atlanta, uh, Augusta, Clark County, and other cities around Georgia, and about, I think, 20-some cities around the nation. Uh, so we'd like the Clinton County to consider that and, and to set up a study group to track uh, climate issues and table rise and other issues to uh, lead to some proposals for taking specific actions to reduce those threats uh, through, as I say, both through uh, reducing greenhouse gases and through the other uh, ongoing resiliency and adaptation efforts. Climate scientists overwhelmingly agree that the trends in sea level rise and other impacts caused by the heat trapping effects of greenhouse gases are accelerating, although the rate of acceleration is uncertain and very controversial, of course, and the timing of severely threatening conditions in the future is unknown. But given the uncertainty, I don't think that's a justification for delaying. It's a justification for getting right on it as a precautionary measure to reduce those impacts as much as possible, as soon as possible, given the vulnerability of this Georgia. So in here, uh, in my notes, which I'll forward to you later when they're corrected, I've caught, caught some uh, typos there. I have five, four points for a program of action that I'm recommending uh, <coughs> for consideration in light of uh, sea level rise and climate change. One is a reliable program for monitoring and assessing the uh, impacts of major impacts, especially of uh, threats to coasts such as erosion and uh, flooding to jeopardize property value and economic viability. Second, preparing a list of priority projects to help mitigate and constrain destructive impacts of rising sea level and major storms, including hurricanes. Third, exploring financing, financing options to support implementation of the priority projects identified. This assessment is especially critical due to ongoing threats that are impairing essential insurance and financing available for coastal properties according to reliable financial reports. And by the way, there are a number of articles better than the one who just handed out to you. I had technical difficulties getting the other ones ready, but I can get them to you later. Uh, just recently, the financial uh, uh, reports and financial uh, media, a lot of attention to the costs of climate change and the, and the importance of those areas that are most vulnerable to getting on to the problem of addressing those threats. Uh, and fourth, a thorough evaluation of steps that can be taken by the county to reduce the cause of, of climate threats to coastal property value and financial stability by curbing the emission of greenhouse gases. Such steps include tax incentives for investing in energy efficiency and solar power equipment, uh, supplemented by zoning provisions that support the use of, the, of these uh, initiatives and the benefits of them in both residential and commercial areas. So given the pivotal impacts of ongoing environmental changes on the future of coast of Georgia. We, the Center for Sustainable Coast, strongly advise adopting a timely, comprehensive program of actions to protect private property, infrastructure, and financial stability, as described previously. Thanks, Walt. Thank Good evening. I'm Cesar Alvarez. I live on uh, St. Simons Island as well. If you aren't asleep yet talking about you know, resiliency and uh, sea lives, I'm going to talk a little bit longer. Uh, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to, opportunity to attend the uh, forum that was held at the Coastal Cottage that was put on by the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Community Foundation. Uh, it was quite enlightening. In fact, there were probably 200 plus people who attended that meeting. Uh, I expected uh, not really good news, but uh, uh, it was quite calm. I think everybody was deliberate. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, speculation in, uh, in whether or not we were going to have sea rise or whether it's going to occur. Uh, and there were some interesting uh, comments made there. And uh, if you attended Mason Waters of the United uh, Community Bank was there, and his uh, uh, comments were both humorous and went to the point. Uh, I'll quote some of his comments. He, he said about sea rise, and uh, some of the issues that the, the banks are addressing, at least his bank, is if you don't get insurance, I can't lend you money. So if, and that means if you can't get flood insurance or you can't afford flood insurance, you're not going to be able to borrow money from him to build a house. For most people, obviously, uh, uh, borrow money to purchase their homes. 
And he said, uh, climate gentrification, that's a relatively new term. Properties that are in hazard areas are not growing or appreciating in value or not appreciating at the rate of other areas. And that came from a Harvard study. High and dry properties are appreciating. And as you all know, uh, most of our properties in the county are relatively low-lying properties. He went on to say that property that has always been most valuable to us may not always be the most desirable. We are changing behaviors of the land consumer on the coast. It can happen here. And the most important, one of the most important things he mentioned during his uh, uh, talk is that his bank, United Community Bank, is assessing its real estate portfolio exposure to sea lives. And that's a relatively small community bank in the grand scheme of things. So you can be assured that every major bank in the country, every major REIT, every major insurance company, they're the ones who are putting out billions of dollars in loans, they're also joint venture and developer properties are looking very closely at uh, sea rise. And the primary re reason, the primary reason is they have shareholders and uh, st uh, stakeholders who uh, they have to uh, provide information to and they're demanding information about the types of loans they're making and the areas in um, which they're making the loans. Uh, there was an article uh, in Red, uh, Industry News, which is a, a news uh, for the REIT industry. And what uh, they state here in this article probably and also applies to major insurance companies and also to major banks when they look at areas and where they're going to invest their money. REITs are being pressed by their investors to provide more accounting of how much risk they face with regard to so-called climate change events and more information about what they plan to do about it. The effort for a long time was focused on negation, says Ben Myers, Director of Sustainability for Boston Properties, Inc., a major REIT. Now there's compelling evidence supporting the case for proactively adapting for changing climate. We should anticipate the risks associated with, risk, with sea level rise, severe storms and heat, and be prepared to manage events. About 35% of REIT properties are exposed to climate hazards such as inland floods, coastal floods, and sea rise. Properties exposed to sea, uh, to sea level rise are selling at a 7% discount. Resiliency is now a key part of development. REITs are starting to incorporate resiliency measures into their development projects, which is basically what we're talking about you know, doing here uh, at, at a certain scale. For example, uh, Boston Properties placed critical equipment uh, in the 30, uh, 32 feet above grade for its stock 72 office building in Brooklyn Navy Yard. They also put uh, flood protection devices such as barriers and barrier panels. Uh, they also instituted a comprehensive resiliency plan setting up uh, flood barriers, site staff, generation, uh, generating power on their premises. These are all things that REITs are looking at in order to satisfy their, uh, their stakeholders and shareholders. But yet, with all of that being said, uh, that it was stated in the article that there is not yet a clear standard or established best practice for the real estate industry. So they're still, like all of us, looking for how do we uh, address uh, sea rise. The most famous area, I guess, uh, certainly the uh, ground zero for sea rise activity right now appears to be the southeast, uh, southeastern United States, with Miami being the, uh, the major area. And uh, Miami has a uh, uh, climate adaption and mitigation goals. In November of 2017, the uh, voters endorsed the Miami Forever Bond. Mr. Moderator, you're, you're about 35 seconds over, so if you could wrap. Okay. Well, they, they, they uh, established a bond of which one of the $400,000, of which one half of that is going to be devoted to addressing sea rise issues. So it's something that's critical. If we're going to get financing, if we're going to continue to thrive, it's money is what talks around here, and uh, we've got to be assured that we can address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Melinda Ennis-Roden, and I live on the island 
Um, but I also um, am the Executive Director of Family Connection of Glen County, and we work with the community across Glen County in uh, collaboration with nonprofits and with um, the school system um, and civic organizations to improve the lives of all children and families in Glen County and improve uh, socially and uh, financially all aspects of their lives. So I'm here today to talk about a personal experience uh, with flooding and uh, what I've witnessed working in Family Connection with people on the mainland in Brunswick. My husband and I uh, discovered St. Simons about 35 years ago when we first got married. And we dreamed of living here and having a home someday. And we worked years, years and years, finally bought a little house mid-island um, about 15 years ago. And when our youngest left for college, I took the job full-time with Family Connection down uh, here in Clay County. So then, uh, we've been here, we live here about full-time now, about five years. Um, and I met so many folks throughout Glen County and my job with Family Connection and all walks of life, wonderful people um, who are all working to improve our community. And then the hurricanes came, first Matthew and then Irma. Our home was flooded, although we are nowhere near the sea. Our neighborhood was flooded largely because of poor decisions made by developers about 20 years ago. At that time, a new condo development was built near our neighborhood in an asphalt sea, so there was no way for the water to run off. The developers put a pump um, to run the condo water into a, a canal that runs down the back of our neighborhood. Um, this is all from the neighbors who lived there at the time, pardon me, who told, told, told us all about this. So again, 20 years ago, the developers in a statement that we have read from our neighbors said that the uh, flooding from this pump was highly unlikely. Our neighbors uh, signed petitions, they protested, but to, to no avail, and so they ultimately suffered the defeat. The, the pump was put on the canal, and uh, lo and behold, with Irma, the highly unlikely flooding came through our neighborhood when the pump went off, just as predicted all those years ago. But we recovered because we had flood insurance. We paid dearly for it. I'm sure all of you do and know how much it costs. But we make it a priority because we know this place is going to continue to have these kinds of incidents. But on the mainland with the people I work with in Brunswick, there are many, many people who can't afford flood insurance that cost thousands of dollars a year. I've met many of these people. I'm also on a committee called Volunteer Organization Assisting Disaster, which is VOAD, and we work on disaster relief for people which was formed after Irma and Matthew. A lot of the people in those homes that were flooded in neighborhoods like College Park are elderly, living on fixed incomes. They can barely pay their light bills, much less pay for flood insurance. And after Irma, despite FEMA agents who were here for months, they, they were here helping. We had other service organizations come in. The Lutherans came in to help people uh, repair homes who, who couldn't afford to do anything. We still had $1.3 million worth of unmet needs after Irma. There are still tarps on roofs of homes in Brunswick. And some people actually just had to walk off and leave a home that they could no longer live in, but, but they couldn't afford to repair. So, just like the decisions that were made 20 years ago that impacted us, you guys are making decisions with this plan that are going to impact for future generations. So I want you to think about that. My husband and I are not going to leave tons of money to our sons. We have poured almost everything into our home here on St. Simon's Island. We wanted to build a place where they would love to come and bring their own families. And after we're gone, the home we built on St. Simon's Island will be the, uh, the legacy that we leave to them. Our story is just one. There are many, many other stories out there like ours. And, they, and the impacts from the sea level rise and the flooding have got to be a priority as we face the, the coming years. Some of the stories that I've told you about are tragic losses, like people who 
had to walk away from their homes. But all of the stories of people who live, in, who live down here share one thing in common. We love this place. We're here because we love this place. So I ask you here tonight to please make the story of our future one of resiliency and not the story of further loss for the many families of our community. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Megan DeRosiers and I am the CEO of a nonprofit organization here in Glen County called 100 Miles. We do coastal conservation of the 100 mile Georgia coast. And I want to st first just start off by thanking all of you for coming together and hosting this community forum. And I want to thank all the speakers ahead of me because you all made really brilliant points and I'm very impressed with the commitment that everybody that I've heard so far has to the future of this place. Um, I'm here tonight to just remind us all that Glen County has three of the drivable islands on the Georgia coast. There's only four of them. We have three here in Glen County. While we have been relatively slow to develop compared with other coastal communities in this country, growth is knocking on our door. Unfortunately, it's happening in an unbalanced way on our, in our county. Some communities are feeling the pinch and they're suffocating. Other communities are starved as they're feeling the blight of neglect. And this zoning ordinance revision is an opportunity to correct that imbalance. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, four recommendations, but, um, and one of them is going to be about resiliency, and I'll just skim over it because it was covered so well by the other people. Um, but Woody put up a slide earlier, and it said, um, one size does not fit all. And he's right about that. But all places in Glynn County deserve to be special, or in other words, desirable. So let's think about desir desirability, okay? And when we think about zoning, we think about form and function. And desirability is really the combination of both of those things. How can we make our communities more aesthetically pleasing, and how can we make them function better? That's what a zoning ordinance is supposed to address. So my main recommendations first are to continue to work together as the Joint Planning Commission. I understand the need to meet separately, but we also have to remember that we travel throughout our community. And so as we look at zoning, we have to look at a map of the county and really understand where people go every day. What are the employment centers? What are the shopping centers? Where are the schools? I live in downtown Brunswick. My sons go to school at Oglethorpe Elementary. I drive through the island every day. Um, and I know people from the island come over to the mainland every day. So let's think about how to make the lives of the people who live here easier through this zoning ordinance, through both form and function. Second, related sea level rise, flooding, stormwater management, storm protection. I urge you to look at FEMA's community rating system as a guide for both learning what tools can be implemented to um, help us better manage sea level rise and flooding, but also what tools can be implemented to help reduce the flood insurance rates that our residents are currently paying. The more of those tools that we implement, the better rating we get and the better rates we get, the better rating our community gets and the better, the better flood rates our residents get. Third, um, I just, this is something nobody's mentioned yet, and um, it's in my comment letter, and I wanted to raise it today. There's a question in the diagnostic report about architectural standards, and I would submit to you that architectural standards should be passed for many places, but one of the places that they're often overlooked is the I-95 interchanges. Those I-95 interchanges are the gateways to our community, and we need to look at architectural standards for those locations so that when people pull off the interstate and come to those intersections or those, you know, commercial centers or whatever, they are attracted to our area and they are encouraged to go deeper and explore more deeply into our communities. And then finally, I know that um, we have an issue with tap-in fees for sewer and water, and we also have issues with um, overdevelopment on St. Simons Island, I would encourage you to look at tools like rural zoning, 
categories with densities of between one unit to three acres and one unit to 10 acres on the northern end of St. Simons Island and also in the western part of the county. This can help ease the development pressures in those places and it also can take the pressure off of expensive sewer and water line extensions. The other part of this rural zoning can be conservation development standards. Those conservation developments can be developments in those areas, but they're where the homes are clustered and the open space is maximized. So those were the points I wanted to emphasize tonight. Again, I thank you for your commitment to this community and its future. Catherine Ridley. I am the Vice President of Education and Communications also at 100 Miles, uh, but I'm also the coordinator for the St. Simons Island Sea Turtle Project and a project leader with the Georgia Sea Turtle Cooperative, whose mission is to maintain the viability of marine turtle populations in Georgia and the ecosystems on which they depend. So tonight I wanted to address Section 727-7, Sea Turtle Protection Requirements Beachfront Lighting. Sea turtles are a beloved species across our coast. Our most common nesting sea turtle, the loggerhead, is a threatened species under, the, under both state and federal laws, including the Endangered Species Act. Lighting is a significant threat to sea turtle populations. Adult females actively avoid or abandon nesting attempts um, in brightly lit areas, and artificial lighting causes hatchlings to misorient or crawl the wrong way away from the ocean. In 2018, I documented a near total loss of, nest, of a nest due to light and misorientation on our beach on, near Gould's Inlet. And in fact, on St. Simons, we are regularly documenting this type of interaction from otherwise healthy turtles that would, would have or could have contributed to the population. Glen County's beach lighting ordinance was last updated in the 90s. Since that time, advances in our understanding of sea turtle biology, coupled with updates in lighting technology, um, have really rendered the existing ordinance um, obsolete. Today, there is a much greater variety of turtle-friendly LED lights available than there was certainly 30 years ago. Updating the ordinance would align it with best practices of local businesses as well, such as Georgia Power, who are already making the switch to energy-efficient LEDs. We'll submit full written recommendations that I certainly hope you will consider, um, but I'd like to touch on those tonight. Specifically, we propose first adding requirements regarding the light wavelength, which is missing from the current ordinance entirely. This is significant because sea turtles orient most strongly towards the shorter wavelength of, wavelengths of light, white light, um, and are least sensitive to amber or red LEDs producing higher wavelengths. A wavelength of 560 nanometers or greater uh, should be the minimum standard. Second, removing the third bullet regarding safety and security lighting, only because as written, this provides an overly broad loophole by which almost any lighting um, could be argued to be exempt. Further, it's unnecessary given that today with the wide variety of lighting options available, any lighting, safety or otherwise, can be made compliant and uh, done so without illuminating the beach. Third, we suggest that enforcement language and appropriate penalties, which are lacking, um, be added. As it stands, when we identify violations um, on the beach that lead to losses, um, there's really few, if any, adequate options that we can pursue to ensure that changes are made. Overall, we recommend that Glen County's ordinance simply mirror the language of the Jekyll Island Beach Lighting Ordinance, which was updated in 2008. This was based on Florida's model ordinance at the time, and it reflects many of the best practices <clears throat> that we would like to see countywide. Simply having one uniform ordinance across our entire county would ensure better compliance, collaboration, and management. I should note that on St. Simons, my team and I educate thousands of beachgoers every summer. Um, I regularly field questions from visitors who question and wonder why Glen County doesn't have a stronger ordinance in place. Um, many of those people are visiting our community specifically because of the opportunities to interact with wildlife. In fact, in a recent survey of coastal Georgia visitors, 62% of the respondents indicated wildlife viewing as a primary reason for their trip, and 95% strongly agreed that it was important for the government to enforce ordinances and regulations that protect wildlife, even if it caused some personal inconvenience. 
Finally, many of you may know that 2019 was a banner year for nesting loggerhead sea trolls, with nearly 4,000 nests documented across our coast. It's important to recognize, though, that that milestone did not happen by accident, but was the result of many decades of hard work by previous generations who worked together to strengthen ordinances and protections for these iconic species. We simply cannot take that progress for granted or we'll backslide. The hatchlings that emerged from our beaches this past summer are going to return to nest along our same beaches in about 30 years, or approximately the year 2050. Loggerheads are still a threatened species, and the choices that we make today will determine their future, for better or for worse. Our community values sea turtles. We come together to celebrate their successes, and we benefit both economically and through our quality of life um, simply by their presence on our coast. So I hope that we will choose to reflect that love by protecting them in this ordinance. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to host, for y'all hosting this event and the opportunity to comment. Um, again, I hope you'll look for my written comments and, and please contact me if you have further questions or would like to discuss. Thank you. My name is Anne Pequini and I'm a full-time St. Simon's Island resident and I live in Sea Palms West. Can you hear me? Better? Okay. Um, I'd like to address the trend that I'm seeing of more and more cookie cutter development on the island. Um, nobody likes the taste of cookie cutter development and our community cannot continue to exist on a diet of unhealthy, pre-packaged and mass-produced monotony. The result of this diet are clogged arteries, backed up plumbing, and indigestion. As commissioners, you have the power to change the, t the status quo. And I get it, you are relying on the same old recipe, the current outdated ordinances that are inconsistent and stale. The current ordinances are a recipe for disaster. Developers submit and you accept the same batches of bland cookie cutter subdivisions. The same copy and paste architecture, devoid void of trees, a green space, a visual interest, and planning for stormwater runoff. We are paying TSW to write a new cookbook, but they need co-authors, you the commissioners, the community development staff, and we the people. We need to come up with new recipes for tasteful and creative development by adding the following ingredients. Number one, impact fees. Number two, less in environmental impact, specifically lower density, open space requirements, larger buffers, no clear cutting, realistic drainage, and realistic stormwater management. And number three, public involvement. Specifically, public comment and written notice to all adjacent property owners of any proposed zoning changes, demolition work, and land clearing. The end product can be quality versus quantity neighborhoods with increase in property values increase in quality of life and sustainable communities. But let's not rush the process or we'll end up with a half-baked plan or worse, burned by the insanity of doing the same thing over and over again. And remember, we are what we eat. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janet O'Hara. I'm a seasonal resident of St. Simon's Island, and I would just like to speak to you just, just from my heart, really. Um, I will forever be grateful to the dear American friends that uh, nearly 20 years ago introduced me and my husband to um, St. Simon's Island and this absolutely gorgeous Georgia coast. And they, in turn, and the well, Georgia Coast, we now have a home on St. Simons, and we now spend up to six months of the year living here and maximizing all the opportunities it gives. Those same friends say to me now, they are grateful to me because every time I come to St. Simons and this Georgia Coast anew, 
I always talk to them with such enthusiasm about the wonderful beach walks I take every morning, the bird watching I do in the marsh, the neighbourhood bike rides I take under the live oak trees, and they say, I remind them what's really special about this place because it's so easy to just take things for granted and, unf and forget all the really good things when you get caught up in the minutiae of life and all its issues. But the three things that I really care about and I really love here, let's look at them from sort of two different angles. I absolutely love the marsh. Everybody knows the marsh. It looks beautiful, particularly when the sun sets on it. That's why it's called the Golden Isles. But how many people know that the salt marsh here is one of the largest unspoiled areas of salt marsh in the whole world? It offers, it's nature's way of offering us an absolutely wonderful um, buffer and help to um, water rising, storm surge. That salt marsh has the most amazing absorption, powers of absorption. The beach and the dunes, everyone loves the dunes with the sea oaks growing, the sun shining on them, we walk on there with our families. But those dunes are again nature's way of protecting not only the beach against high tides and storms, but also protecting the land behind, a lot of which now has our communities and our neighbourhoods in. And the live oak trees, absolutely gorgeous, you know, amazing canopies hung with Spanish moss. They're one of the defining features of these islands. But those live oak trees, they're thick, solid trunks. They're incredible spreading root system. They are nature's way of protecting that soil against erosion, and they can withstand incredibly high winds and storms. How many live oaks have come down in the recent storms? <coughs> Not that many. So what I wanted just to mention, this is in the context of environmental protection. When you're looking at setbacks, whether it's from the marsh or the beach, we've got to have absolute, sensible, viable setbacks that take into account all the resiliency that other people have so eloquently described and so essential. But also what we want to make sure that the area within that setback, whether it's from the marsh or from the beach, that whole area is totally protected so that nature can work with us to do its job to protect the land. Likewise with the live oak trees, there is absolute minimal um, ordinance at the moment to protect those trees. That needs to be far, far stronger because those trees need to work with us to protect the land from erosion, from water runoff, from oak development. There's a reason these islands are called barrier islands. They are because they're there, they're nature's way of protecting the mainland from the storms and all the pressures that come from the oceans. And the way that nature does this is populated these amazing barrier islands with the salt marsh and with the sand and the dunes and the beach and with the live oak trees. So my, all I want to say is let's work with nature when we're planning, uh, when we're doing our zoning and we're planning these ordinances and let's not, not, not lose sight of um, what we otherwise might take for granted and say work with nature to achieve that. I'm Julian Smith, and I may be getting some feedback here. Let me take this off. Uh, I'm Julian Smith. My wife and I have owned a home on St. Simon's Island since 1993. And four years ago, anticipating sea level rise, we bought a second home uh, on high and dry land on the, the mainland. That's not something available to everyone in the county, but it's the advice I would give to those who live in St. Simon's. Uh, <clears throat> look for higher ground. Uh, I have no comments, only some questions for you 12 commissioners. Let me, let me start. Why has it taken more than six weeks since the release of this report before the public was allowed to ask questions about it in public in front of other members of the public? When, if ever, will a similar public hearing on this report be held on St. Simon's Island. How many of you commissioners would agree that this document, that this document is flawed by gobbledygook, pointless pretty pictures, lip service to aspirational pieties, 
and buzzwords like balance and sure and vision. How many of you wonder why the many references in this document to sea level rise, high flood risk areas, flood elevation, coastal flooding, wave action during storms, and hurricanes are not followed by concrete proposals for dealing with those threats. How many of you commissioners would agree or disagree with the claim in the first sentence of this report that, quote, land development is shaped by many forces but is primarily shaped by local zoning and development regulations, unquote. And how many of you would agree or disagree with me that those local zoning and development regulations are actually shaped by the seven county commissioners who appointed you, who hired the consultants responsible for this report, and who will have the final word and the final vote on whatever comes out of this zoning update process. How many of you would agree that it might be better for our planning commissioners, both on the islands and on the mainland, to be elected by the voters who actually live in those districts. And I confess, I don't think many of you would want to stand for election to a planning board. But that's, I think, what it must come to eventually. How many of you agree or disagree with the premise in the second sentence in this document that, quote, these regulations should balance growth with public health, safety, and welfare, while also ensuring that development is consistent with the community's vision for its future, unquote. In other words, how many of you agree or disagree that growth is so important that it can or should be somehow balanced with public health, safety, and welfare? or that it is even remotely possible for a community as divided as ours is to have a single coherent vision. How many of you have studied the Planning Commission bylaws and understand, understood that you have the power to, quote, select, supervise, and coordinate with any consultant or consultants in the preparation of any development or master plans for Glen County, unquote. How many of you are willing to ask your county commissioners why you were not required or allowed to exercise that power in the creation of the current future land use map or the selection and supervision of the TSW consultants? Finally, are any of you willing to start exercising that power now before now before it is too late. Thank you. Good evening. I want to thank you guys for all um, coming together tonight so that people can make their voices heard. And I'm not going to repeat all of the environmental concerns. It's been well said by everyone. One thing that hasn't been addressed tonight that I want to encourage you to, um, to look at is addressing affordable housing across the county. So I know it is in the policy questions that you're asking, but we want all of us to enjoy, uh, the residents of the whole county to enjoy and be able to, um, to enjoy and prosper in this community that we love so much. But our young professionals don't have enough money to pay for housing here. A lot of residents in the unincorporated areas of Glen County, there's not affordable housing. So I would encourage you to, to keep looking at that as you look at the ordinances. Thank you very much. Uh, Ma'am, ma ma thank you for your comments. Would you please state your name where you live for the I'm rest? sorry, sir. I'm Julie Jordan, and I live on St. Simon's Island. Thank you. Good evening, planning board members, planning commission members. Uh, I'm Ed Meadows. I'm a resident of Glen County. And when I look at you sitting up in front of the room here, I get in tremendously enthusiastic. Because when I think about the brain power that sits there 
grappling with the issues that we're trying to shape for our future of our community. I'm very encouraged that you're going to be leading and helping guide that transition. This will be a little bit different. Uh, let me start backwards. Let me, let me start backwards. Let me talk a little bit about the challenge that we know that you face. When I was on the planning commission for the St. Simons, we were faced with a development proposal that was more than 85% in floodplain, and it had poor soils, no drainage, and it flooded on a regular basis. You can see the rack way up several hundred feet from the water's edge up into the woods. We were told by a county attorney and by the staff that we were required to approve that subdivision in that floodplain by the county ordinance. So I understand that this is the challenge that you face, which is under no circumstances should a public body ethically have been trying to say to the public, this is an okay place to build a home. It is not. So, we'll try to help you the best we can. I was very fortunate to have a 40-year career in land use and real estate. I've had a real estate practice for over 30 years. I'm an appraiser. I've been a land manager for millions of acres. I teach advanced professional continuing education for real estate industry at the national level in several states. And based on this background, I submitted detailed recommendations to TSW and to the county staff. Um, I, I start with this background for a reason. Tonight I want to take a little broader view than the specifics. For many years, I worked for one of the 10 largest private family land owners in the United States. We had a zoning issue that went to the state Supreme Court. I'm very familiar with these issues. I mentioned this background for several reasons. The county has an important role in guiding and directing development in a way that benefits all property owners, not just builders and developers. The county has authority to zone and regulate for appropriate uses that will protect all property values. It is important to be clear that changing the zoning and reducing development does not automatically result in a taking. It does not automatically result in a taking. How do I know this? I've been to the Supreme Court. I teach it at the national level. I'm an appraiser, and that's where it begins, with the, with the, with the data, with the facts. The county can do this. Don't let anyone tell you that they can't. The county can amend zoning and ordinance to more appropriately address today's needs. On St. Simons, we have a lot of class development texts and other situations like that from years of action or inaction. These can be amended. The ordinances can be updated and they need to be. Your policy questions refer to many of these and I hope you get some good feedback. Key is what, what will be done with them. Density, setbacks, land clearing, height, signage, runoff, drainage, wetlands, repairing areas, floodplain protection. The answer is yes, those are the policy questions you're looking for feedback on. They need to be addressed. All of these can be brought to contemporary standard. All ordinances need to reflect this critical fact. St. Simons Island is a barrier island in the ocean, yet we almost never see that recognized in the local news or discussed at the county administration or even in the community conversation. Our visitors who support the tourism economy in Flynn County yeah. are shocked when they learn that our charm and our beauty are not protected. And our residents are appalled when they find out their property values are at risk from invading strip malls, congestion, filling of floodplains, siting septic systems in marshlands, and general loss of charm. 
A lot of people have observed that the approach to development in this area is quite different than it is in other parts of the country. Where here we've focused on meeting the minimum standard, and in a lot of places they focused on what's the best possible development we can provide. We need to partner with the local real estate industry to develop a strategy to solve this. We can do better. You are planning commissioners. You're appointed to apply the principles of sound planning and the future well-being of the community and all landowners. Mr. Meadows, your, your time. Is Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Scott Smith. I live on the mainland. Um, a couple of things is um, what brought my attention is the national poverty level is at 15 percent. The Brunswick City itself is at around 40 percent. St. Simon's five, and mainland the whole county as a whole is 20. Um, I like to maybe put our zoning coordinates and codes and whatnot with the mainland to try to uh, promote economic development, period. Also, maybe increase setbacks, have sidewalks or street lights to allow poor people to walk or bike to work, get their medicine, come home, and save matter. Uh, and then the comment I have on the signs here, I think that there are a lot of people on St. Simons Island that take frequent trips and don't ever see much in mainland county itself to make that drive from St. Simons Island to 95 more pleasurable. Let's get the main corridor 17, Darien Highway, let's get that better looking. Make that little district, maybe get rid of billboard signs have smaller signs, promote the canopy and tree and landscape, and uh, maybe get the power lines down below ground over Georgia Power or something. Uh, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Vincent Elbow, citizen of uh, Glen County, resident in St. Simons. Just uh, the audience here, they're curious, how many people are residents of St. Simons here tonight? And then the mainland? Okay, just, all right. Mostly what I have to say is about St. Simons, but feel free if I bring up a good point, consider it to the mainland too. Uh, Mr. Smith there brought up something, maybe we want to rephrase things a little bit differently. Had, had uh, master plans been drawn up 40 years ago, where would St. Simons be now? I'm of the opinion, and you've all had uh, complaints about traffic, overcrowding, long lines on the island. Maybe that would have, should have been avoided many years ago. So uh, we jump around here a little bit. Vision statement for Glen County, character, culture, natural beauty, value, protected by its citizens. But this whole thing smacks that you're going to have development whether you want it or not. And I say for St. Simons, and again, for the mainland people, you don't want the development opposed. So the whole thing is ramming something down our throats that we may not want. That's what it sounds like to me, because everything is how you're going to develop. St. Simons has been enough. Uh, well, there's several other things here. Mr. Ragsdale, at one of the uh, showings of the Can St. Simons Survive Success, brought up a few points. Be careful what you ask for, it might come true. Complain about traffic. He, really, he raised the possibility of widening Frederica Road to four lanes. All right, now there's been other complaints. People coming out of the neighborhoods on Frederica Road want to turn left. Bad enough for them already. Can you imagine if it was four lanes? Uh, Demery Road. Here again in this uh, report says three commercial districts. I would guess that's the village. 
uh, along Frederica by Re uh, Retreat Village, Redfern Village, and again up by uh, Sea Island and Frederica Road. Well, just recently there was passed change of language for uh, airport properties. So you have to consider that at least a fourth development zone. Again, traffic on Emory Road is already bad enough. You can imagine more development there. And again, widening roads. It's just going to, quality of life is going to go down in St. Simons. Uh, more to specific zoning ordinances and such. Should we allow three-story buildings in the village? No. That's just going to be more chaos in the village. I can't imagine with um, Sandy Beaches LLC buying up that block where the kiosks are. There goes your, your charm of the village. So, uh, Sandy Beaches uh, does luxury resorts, beach hotels kind of stuff. So I can just imagine that would just be a three-story hotel there. Take out all those kiosks that everybody seems to like. Uh, some other things here. Somebody else addressed that, so I'm going to pretty much be done. Except for the one thing here that um, been vacationing St. Simon's since I was mere tad. Four year resident now, and I've noticed a lot of changes, development. And it just seems to me that uh, St. Simon's has been pretty much seen, oh, seen as a cash cow for the county. Like I said, I'm a citizen of Glen County, resident of St. Simon, so I'm not saying not in my backyard, don't do this. I just don't think it can be done. Uh, somebody else mentioned here College Park flooding. Yes, take care of our tax dollars, goes to College Park, help their flooding. Uh, just as the commission has chosen to help the village in the flooding there. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really trying not to say not in my backyard. I'm not saying St. Simon's residents deserve any more attention than Glen County residents. As a matter of fact, again, Mr. Ragsdale, uh, brought up the point of sometimes it seems to be a divisiveness between the mainland and the islands. And that's, that's not my point at all. Uh, Dr. Murphy, I saw him here earlier. Yep, sir, you've, you've reached your time. Time, okay. I'm John Dieterman, uh, and I'd like first to thank you for your service on these boards. Uh, I know how difficult it can be. Uh, I myself have served on the Board of Education of Glen County 2000-2003. I'm a 40-year resident of St. Simons, and my background is I'm a licensed professional engineer in Georgia, and right now I am a FEMA reservist. I have spent January to August of 2019 this year in uh, the panhandle of Florida working with Michael and Bay in Gulf counties, the hardest hit, and I've been to Mexico Beach several times. Uh, I would like to say that in looking into your building codes that the Florida has just revised their coastal building codes. They are online and they are very, very good and I would like to recommend that you look at them as you look into building codes for Glen County. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, here now we will close the public comment portion. Um, before we turn it over to uh, response from TSW, uh, Mainland Planning Commissioners, do you have anything you'd like to say? Okay. Any members of the IPC would like to address anything that was mentioned today? Or? Okay. Mr.
Mr. Giles, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all I can say is after all those comments is wow. Um, really appreciate all of the detail and passion that's very helpful to us. So um, thanks again to everyone. And, and I won't take the time to respond to everything. I know there are a lot of specific things, and I think the answer to a lot of those is yes, we will continue the conversation. But just wanted to say a, a few things. One is that um, we have a couple of business cards up here that do have the email address and phone number on them. So if you want to take one of those before you go, that's a great way to communicate with us. And for those of you that had written statements, um, if you could share those with us, or if you're willing to, um, either tonight or by email, um, that would be great. I know um, a lot of comments on, on sort of the environment and climate change. I just wanted to talk briefly about a little bit of what we talked about at the October meeting. Um, there's really sort of three different areas that you think about when you're looking at, at climate change. Some of those are coastal areas that are extremely valuable. We think of the Savannah Historic District, something that everyone in the state would say, yes, this is an area worth preserving. And there are areas like that that may be worth very costly engineering um, to save or state expenditures. There are areas on the other end of the spectrum that are totally natural. Um, the Georgia coast has been where it is roughly since the last ice age, and the marshes will continue to migrate uh, as sea level rises, so those natural areas will sort of change on their own. But a lot of Glen County is sort of in between where there is development. It's not totally natural, and it's not one of those areas that is worth high expenditure. So I think we're going to have to think about what techniques look like to preserve the development. Several of you talked about. Um, preserving development for the next generation. And really that applies to a lot of what we're doing when we're thinking about design or the signed ordinance or, or regulation is um, thinking about what's appropriate for these different areas and what can we do. Not that we'll change everything today because the zoning ordinance is going to be a slow, long thing. It's putting the rules in place next year that will regulate development for the next generation. But we have to do that now if we want to see things, see things improve. Um, I also did want to mention we have a lot of other consultants on our team, including South Face, which is an environmental firm that's going to help us with some of the environmental piece. We have engineers who will be helping us with some of the flooding regulations. We have an attorney who's helping us with a lot of legal aspects. So a lot of minds, uh, besides those in the room tonight, that will be helping think about that. So um, with that, I, I don't have any uh, further comments if there's not anything else from the commissioners. Okay. I'd like to thank you all again for coming and for your comments, and we are adjourned. <laughs>